I'm going to actually keep, uh, uh, kick um, these groups of people, which are very wicked. Now, I'm going to kick them hard on this one. Come but on. you're all, but I got the members here who won't walk out mad, so I think I'll be fine. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so the reason, so uh, people online, I hope they'll understand why I'm kicking them. Because this is, we saw one, uh, so I'm not going to mention people's names, but we, our church has witnessed some people who opened their eyes to King James Bible-believing truth, dispensationalism, and some people have struggled with this problem called homosexuality. But they converted to King James Bible and dispensationalism. But the thing is, is that you got to realize this, homosexuals have souls too. Yes, it is a wicked, vile sin, but they have souls too, people. All right, if you were born from their background, raised in the kind of environment they were in, you probably end up like them or maybe even worse as a sinner. Yeah. So you better thank God, God put you at a nice upbringing. So Amen. To speak. Amen. Okay? You got to realize that it's sick that in San Francisco, there are parents who have the audacity to take their children to libraries where there are trannies reading stories about about some prince who became a princess or something like that. Come on, great. And then she asked for a raise of hands. How many of you little kids want to be princesses when you grow up? And these little kids have no idea, and mommy and daddy make them raise their hand. See, it's wicked. just wicked. It's heinous. What if you or and I were born at that kind of environment? Yeah, bless God See? Not, man. So you got to realize there are poor lost souls who are deceived and going to hell too. Amen. Yes, they're vicious. Yes, they can be wicked. But so are you. You can be yeah. as well as well. Yeah. All right. Now, here's what, who I'm kicking. Are you kicking these guys? No, I've kicked them enough many times. So I'm going to kick this particular group of people. I'm kicking these particular group of people who are wicked as hell, and they teach this wicked, heinous doctrine. It's called Calvinism. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're yeah. King James only. I don't care if you profess to be dispensational. Usually, Calvinists are not dispensational. But aside from that, Calvinism... I hate this system. It's a doctrine from hell because I've seen, and some of you have seen, some yeah. people who thought they were predestined for hell because yeah. they were a homosexual. Uh -huh. And I'm not talking about just one or a few people. I've, I've known many. I've known several, okay? I've known several. So you got to understand this, is that this wicked doctrine makes these people think that, well, you know what? So I'm just doomed to burn in hell for all eternity because this is just in my system. I can't help it. Because remember, homosexuality, what do we argue about homosexuality? It's not by birth, it's by what? Choice. Calvinism, don't they reject choice, free will? And they're also brainwashed with the idea they were born this way. Now think about it. If they're brainwashed with the idea that they are born this way, and then they combine that with what they hear in churches from Calvinism. Oh, God predestined you. It's not your choice why you went to heaven or hell. Oh, no one is then then what, do the, what would the poor homosexual think? The Calvinists are not saying homosexuals are born that way and going to hell. But you got to realize this. These people, when they have this thinking and then they listen to what you, what kind of garbage you preach in your churches, they're going to combine that together and think they were born that way. They were predestinated for hell. I know of some homosexuals like that. But you know, through our video channel and through our church, through our Bible-believing preachers, their eyes got open. And they realized that they were not predestined to be that way. It's a choice that they can personally receive Jesus Christ with a repentant and believing heart. And every day it is a battle to them. You, you got to realize this. Homosexuality is such a wicked, dark, dark, sinful addiction. Yep. It produces suicidal thoughts, maniac, uh, maniacal depression. It's dark and it's sad. You got to realize these people are going through a hard time. And you got to realize that <clears throat> if you give them that hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ by the glorious gospel, Amen. where it's a choice that they can make, it's your choice to receive it or reject it, they have hope. But this wicked doctrine teaches about reprobates. That's what they call it. It's called the reprobate doctrine. 
What is this, Pastor? What that means is when you're a reprobate, that God created you to be that way. And once you're a re reprobate, there's no hope for you to get saved later on. Now, there are, there's these Calvinists that teach this, and I kid you not, there's a group of idiotic, they are not our, our crowd. They are definitely not our crowd. These guys are something else. They're just from La La Land, these guys who can't call themselves KJV, Independent Fundamental Baptists, these guys. These guys deny dispensationalism. They teach that the church will go through the tribulation. They teach that replacement theology, that the church has replaced Israel, and they all agree with the Calvinists. What, what, don't call yourself this. You are not this then. You are not this. KJV only is... And independent fundamental Baptist churches did not teach this kind of ridiculous nonsense shenanigans. They would like to pull off certain quotes from some preachers who taught this kind of doctrine. But here's the thing. If you went up to that pastor, they don't have the guts to say this. If you went directly to that pastor and asked him, do you believe like these guys do, that homosexuals, that they're a reprobate, that who cannot get saved, not a chance in the world, they're going to say, no, I reject that. Fundamentalist pastors throughout all history denied this one. This is, this is a ridiculous, idiotic, moronic doctrine that these fundamentalists would turn to. Now, what do they teach about this? They believe this only applies to, to this kind of people. Now, they'll probably include different groups of people, don't get me wrong. But what they're going to do is that they will particularly and mainly aim for this group and say they're the reprobate. Oh, so do you have a lust problem after other men? Yes, I do. Okay, then you're a reprobate. There's no hope for you. You can't get saved. I kid you not. These guys knock on people's doors, and when they find out they're a homosexual, they move on to the next place. They don't give them the gospel. Yeah, wow. What a wicked, sick person you are. They all emphasize about soul winning, soul winning, winning hundreds of souls, thousands of souls to salvation. You wicked, evil so-and-so you are, man. If you have that kind of responsibility, that heavy yeah. responsibility on your shoulders, you can't turn them down. Jesus says, whosoever is a thirst, Amen. let him come and take the water of life freely. Amen. Didn't Jesus Christ himself said that Sodom and Gomorrah would have repented? Yeah. And that city consisted of homosexuals? Mm -hmm. So these wicked people think that homosexuals don't have a chance. Okay, I'm gonna, re I'm gonna debunk these two heretical groups and you got to realize these two groups, they're like best friends. <laughs> these guys are best friends. They pretend they hate each other, but they're infatuated with each other. And they will do radio show <laughs> hosts and video clips naming each other and calling each other out. What's funny is that I know of three of them, three of them from these two groups that live in the same city together. It's like God made it that way. He predestinated to be that way for those <laughs> people to be together because they're so infatuated with each other. I'm glad I'm, I'm, glad I'm, I'm, glad I'm far away from them. Okay, okay, anyways, let's turn to several of these passages. Let's debunk this. Okay, so I'm going to debunk this reprobate doctrine, just a few of the verses. Okay, let's start off with Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> Romans chapter 9. Okay, we're going to cover some of the doctrines or so-called proof text for Calvinism on the reprobate doctrine. Then I'm going to combat, then I'm going to debunk these weirdos. Okay, so let's start with Romans chapter 9. We'll read verse 17. So then, uh, excuse me. My bad, I read the wrong verse. I'm reading 10, 17. It says right here, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. So notice that this verse seems to show that God raised up Pharaoh to be, uh, to be that instrument of a lost damn sinner. So Pharaoh didn't have a chance, no free will. You're going to also notice right here, go to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus 4. Now here's the thing. Why did God say, I will raise thee up to magnify my name? They failed to realize that God knew that Pharaoh would first choose to reject his word. And then after that, that's why he told Moses that he would harden Pharaoh's heart. See, so it was Pharaoh's free choice first. 
Now, God is a sovereign God. He's not going to waste his power. Just because you made a free choice on something, it doesn't mean that God is so incompatible and so dumb that he's going to go, well, there's nothing I can do about that. No, what he's going to do is that he's going to take whatever free choice you make and use it for his glory. That's you right. can sin, the worst kind of sin, or you can glorify God, the most holy life, who use anything for his glory. Amen. That's a simple answer. Now go to Exodus chapter 4, verse 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. Why? Why? Go to chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 19. Chapter 3, verse 19. And I am sure that the king... Isn't that what God said? This is before Moses even met Pharaoh. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. Did you see that? Did you see that? So God already knew Pharaoh would reject him. So that's the reason why he used, uh, he used that advantage of his choice to harden Pharaoh's heart even more so that he can glorify his name by spreading the ten plagues in Egypt. Let's also look at chapter 5, verse 2. Chapter 5, verse 2. Notice in chapter 5, verse 1, is the first time Moses spoke to Pharaoh, okay? God didn't do any hardening of the heart or anything like that. It's the first time Moses went to Pharaoh, and notice what Pharaoh did in verse 2. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should what? Obey his voice to let Israel go. I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. So look at that. Pharaoh, out of his free choice, said, I'm not going to obey God. So notice it was his free choice. And notice he first rejected the word of the Lord. See, God didn't harden his heart then. He first rejected the word of the Lord. That's why the Lord, he's going to harden Pharaoh's heart later on. Notice... At uh, chapter 8, verse 15. Chapter 8, verse 15. By the way, you'll notice that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. You'll notice that. Chapter 8, verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, respite he what? He hardened, hardened he his hardened. heart. See that? Look at verse 19. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. See that? him in action. Verse 32. <clears throat> and Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also. See that? Uh, you're not convinced? Chapter 9, verse 12. <clears throat> Notice at the same time, and the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them. Now let's look at verse 34. Chapter 9, verse 34. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and what? Hardened his heart. Let's also look at uh, chapter 10, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants. So you notice right here, see, why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Because he made the choice. So he made the choice to reject the Lord, and he hardened his heart. And because of that, the Lord took that advantage to harden him as well. And so why? So that combination can bring him great glory, ultimate glory in the end, about the ten plagues in Egypt. God's not going to let Pharaoh do whatever he wants, and then he's not going to do anything about it. That's right. What God does is whatever you do, God's going to use and for his glory. See, Calvinists have it backwards. They think that God's going to do whatever he wants and you have to follow it. No, that's not how God's work. My God is not that dumb, okay? Where he has to say, you can't put any of your power in there. So I have to take full control on that and you have to do it like a robot. No, God is so brilliant, so powerful, that no matter what decision you make out of your own free will ability, God is a hundred steps ahead of you and yeah. he'll use whatever thing in play for his glory. Amen. Amen. We're even more sovereign, more Calvinist than those Calvinists. See that? We believe that God is in total full control and he can take anything for his glory with whatever choice you make. Here's a favorite one. Go to Joshua chapter 11. Here's one of the favorites. Go to Joshua chapter 11 from the Calvinists. Joshua chapter 11. 
and verse 19. Joshua chapter 11, and then verse 19. All right. So here's the favorite argument that's used from Jimmy White and those other people. So let's debunk this. Joshua chapter 11, verse 19. Here's one of the Calvinist texts. The verse says, There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel, save the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon. All other they took in battle. Why? For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts, that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly, and that they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. So it seems like that these poor Hivites, they were doomed by God to become the enemy of Israel, and that's why God utterly destroyed them. So the atheists have a right to say that God is cruel and unjust and horrible for doing genocide and forcing people to follow that. That's worse than Hitler. Didn't you know that? That's worse than Hitler. Forcing a person to make a wrong decision so that you can become the destruction for genocide. Calvinism is a doctrine from hell. Now here's the thing, is that Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 30 is another one that they use, but we'll skip that one. Now go to Leviticus 18. Here's the answer, Leviticus 18. Leviticus chapter 18. Now Deuteronomy 2 and Joshua 11 are Calvinist verses that they will use. So let's look at some of the verses we debunked. So we looked at Romans 9 and Exodus. And we already debunked that notion. We're now looking at Joshua 11 and Deuteronomy 2. So it seems like the Lord hardened their hearts so that he can destroy them. Okay, this one depended upon choice. You saw that. This one, you'll also notice... Leviticus chapter 18, verse 24 through 25. Now look at this. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things. For in all these, the nations are defiled. Because they're defiled, which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled. Therefore, see, because they made the decision of sin. Therefore, what does God do? I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. You see why God hardened their hearts and uh, made them go against the nation of Israel? Because they've sinned greatly against the Lord. Because of their free choice first of sinning and violating God, what the Lord did is, okay, then I'm going to use that for my glory where I'm going to destroy you eventually. See that? It's not like God doomed them to uh, destruction and for hellfire. No, it's because they made the free choice first of sinning constantly. They're defiled. That's how much they sin. It was so wicked that God says, okay, man, I'm, I'm going to be done with you. I'm going to work it out for my glory how I can destroy you later on. Because you already made the free choice of violating, deliberately disobeying me. And if you think that I'm wrong about that, then how did Rahab get rescued, huh? Wasn't she a prostitute? Should she have been killed? Or was it her free choice... Oh, no, it's not her free choice. Wait, wait a minute. Didn't James chapter 2 said her works, her faith and her works, did it? How did Calvinists argue against that? It was her work, her effort. Wow. All right, if you don't have any argument against that, then let's go to... There are other verses right here that they're going to use, which we won't turn to for time's sake, but there's Isaiah 63 and verse 17. There's also... John chapter 12 and verse 40. Now, if you look at these passages, I'll go one by one. <coughs> In Isaiah 63 verse 17, it seems to show that Israel was uh, decreed to be a reprobate doom to hellfire. They did not have free choice to reject sin because God hardened them to fulfill his purpose. But they forget to read verse 10. Verse 10 totally debunks that. It shows it's because of their choice. See that? It's because of their choice. God hardened their hearts because their hearts rebelled and vexed the spirit to begin with. So you notice that God's hardening, God's working, follows after the free choice. See that? It's always like that in every Calvinist verse. In every Calvinist verse, 
This is the key. There's always a condition. That's right. That's the crux against Calvinism. And some of these weirdos borrowed my arguments to do that against Calvinists, actually. So I know the terms. You guys don't fool me. So anyway, so these numbskulls who tried to attack Calvinism, they borrow from us Bible believers because they don't know any lick of Bible at all. So they all watch us secretly online, pretending that they're not watching us, but they are watching us online, <laughs> borrowing the arguments so that they can learn something themselves. And then these guys, their only verse for this reprobate doctrine is Romans 1. Okay, so let's go to Romans 1. This is ridiculous concerning homosexuality. Now in John chapter 12, verse 40, the simple debunking to this one is that it's a prophecy from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10. And then if you, this is where it debunks this. This is a prophecy, John 12, 40, is directly quoting, it's directly quoting from Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 10. Now when you go to Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 10, you'll notice if you go even to the beginning, just the beginning of the chapter, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and then 18 through 20, this is very eye-opening. So it's prophesied from Isaiah 6, 10. And then before Isaiah can even start his ministry of preaching, you go to chapter 1, and God says this, because they've continually sinned against me, <clears throat> because they continually sinned against me, God would harden their hearts. Again, why? Because he already told them at the beginning, told Isaiah at the beginning, that Israel would not listen to his words, and they would continually sin against him. In fact, he decreed and he demanded Israel to serve him out of their own free will. At chapter 1, verse 18 through 20. How do you speak that one? So just because God, so they think that when, when you're a reprobate, it's because God decreed it to be. No, in this verse, God decreed them to be free from that. What are you going to do? All right, anyways, let's cover this numbskull argument at Romans chapter 1, okay? So what they believe is that because you're into homosexuality, you become a reprobate and you're doomed to hell, there's absolutely no hope for you. So Romans chapter 1. Notice what the Word of God says right here at verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. So see, God gave up on them. That's their mindset. Their mindset is, in Romans 1, God gave them up. So he gave up on them, there's no hope for them. That's their idea. God gave them up to uncleanness, to the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Uh, verse 26, for this cause God gave them up. See, again, unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women... Burned in their lust one toward, toward one another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was me. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. See, so God gave them up. That's what it seems to show the verses. From verses 24 all the way down to the end of verse 32. It seems that God gave up on them and they became reprobates. But you notice verse 25 through 27 is specifically homosexuals. That's where they get their idea that the homosexuals are doomed. That's why in verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. See, they're worthy to die. That's why some of these idiots, they're going to say, we rejoice that there were homosexuals shot at some bar that time. I rejoice. I thank God. I praise God over that because they deserve to die. Well, you idiot. Verse 29 through 31 is not just homosexuals. It's including all those things too. Those sinners. You know who deserves to die? You, 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 and every one of you. Amen. That includes you too, preacher. Amen. Yeah, all of us deserve to die. The only person who didn't deserve to die was Jesus Christ. But he died in our place. Okay? Bunch of idiotic mindsets right here. All right, now, anyways, look at this. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. They stopped at verse 32. Read chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, see that? 
summing up everything in chapter 1 about the homosexuals and all the other sinners. Thou art an inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. Same things as what? From chapter 1. So here are these hypocrites who are judging homosexuals. When chapter 2, verse 1, they're violating and doing the same things at chapter 1. They're picking and choosing sin so that they don't have to include themselves in that list. But look at this. Verse 3, and thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them? See, judges who? Those homosexuals, those sinners at chapter 1. Because you're guilty of it too, it would show. Which do such thing, and doest the what? Same. The same from what? Chapter 1. So we know chapter 1 is not only to homosexuals. This is for sinners in general. That thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Look at verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, or forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that what? The goodness of God leadeth thee to what? Repentance. Repentance. They don't like to read that part. <laughs> okay, we're done. There's your simple answer. They just didn't keep reading. They stopped right here. They didn't keep reading. They didn't keep reading. So that nonsense of homosexualities have no chance to repent. They're reprobates. No, you're wrong. You didn't keep reading the verses. That's why how we debunk Calvinism and this wicked reprobate doctrine from these so-called KJV fundamentalists who are such a small fringe. They don't have more than 20 churches around the whole world. These guys are incredible losers. They got fewer pastors than 20 churches as well. But these guys who are incredible losers and Calvinists who are wicked, heretical people, even though they would give off good intentions, it all comes down to one verse in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You guys are a bird of a feather flocked together, you two guys. You can be infatuated with each other all you want, all right? You guys are born. You guys were predestinated to do this kind of nonsense. <laughs>